Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Let's just all give the Lord thanks for his goodness. Lord, we bless and praise you. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, for mercy and grace and hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Thank you today for being here. Thank you for joining Brother Jackson in, in prayer. Our church has given to this point, just in general mission offerings, um, probably close to $25,000 this year. Um, and that may not include some special gifts. I know some of you, if Brother Steve's going somewhere, some of you sometimes will might help him outside of, of it coming through the church and I know occasionally that happens but money that's come through the church um, you've given a good chunk of money considering our budget and considering um, what we spend on ourselves but there's a lot of things around here we need to fix up and I was looking at the children's church today that carpet's nasty and needs to be um, fixed out of that hallway what's in there Ryan when he was here took it out of a house, a job that they had put down and they didn't like it. And so um, he had to go back and rip it out and they put new carpet down there and he brought that carpet and had some little pieces of it. So it, if you look at it carefully, if you're a professional carpet person, you notice that the grain in the carpet, the way it's turned is different, but he had to do that because of the way it was all cut up. But that, what I'm simply saying is we've made do up there while we've given thousands um, to other folks around the world and I commend you for caring um, but we're gonna also have to spend a little here on ourselves to take care of our own children and families but I just wanted to thank you for your giving and let you understand that we are um, investing a good chunk of our budget in in reaching the lost around the world and it comes out of your faithful giving so the Lord bless you for that everybody good this morning Everybody want to go to Malawi now? <laughs> Brother Steve, I think you're getting a little look behind that smile next to you there that says just sit still and be quiet for a little bit. <laughs> but once that bug bites you, folks, once you see what God does and you watch Him work and you realize it's a whole lot bigger than anything we can do, Amen. and once you realize and get it down in your heart, that God didn't put you on this planet just to occupy some space and leave a little life insurance policy for your kids. He put you down here, as we're going to talk about here in a moment, but I'll just jump ahead. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you're Christ's ambassador. And Paul says, I beg you, I beg you, be, be reconciled to Christ and realize that it's your job to be Christ to the world. Yes. We'll read it exactly from the King James here in a little bit. But when you realize that and you start putting that into your head, and when you get up in the morning, you're not going just to pump gas at the local gas station or um, paint walls or whatever it is you do. That's not who you are and that's not what you do. What you're doing is you are representing Jesus Christ in the specific little community that he's placed you in. And when that really becomes your life, then you want to go everywhere. And you want to see it happen. Or you want to send somebody everywhere. Well, I guess I'll preach a bit. I just feel good this morning. I feel that comfortable presence of the Holy Ghost here. And I'm so glad God's more than just a Savior. He didn't hang on the cross just so that we could get out of hell. But folks, he gave us the Holy Ghost that brings peace and comfort. And I'm glad. I'm feeling it here today and I'm, I'm thankful. Owning and claiming your baggage. We talked about it, owning it the first Sunday. We talked about kind of sorting through it last Sunday. And this morning, we're going to talk about making room for better stuff. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's where we've been reading. 
And we will turn back there again this morning. And just to refresh your mind and give us another starting point, I'll look again at the first three verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We have a hope that if this morning something unusual would happen and our life is gone, we have something far better. If this life dissolves away, we've got one that will never dissolve. Made in the heavens. God has made it, not made with somebody with hands that can build a house, but God's made us a house. And for in this one, verse 2 says, we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now don't picture yourself like the three little pigs here that this house is on your head and you're walking around with this big gable roof thing on your head. He's talking about these bodies of ours, this house, the thing that houses our eternal spirit that will never die. Here on earth, we've got this one. It's dissolving away. How many of you used to pour salt on slugs and watch them slowly dissolve? It's nasty, wasn't it? Our parents let us do that. I'm not comparing you with slugs, and I'm not suggesting we pour salt on each other. But I am saying, as every moment ticks on that clock, these houses of ours are dissolving away. They're going back to the dust from which they came, slowly but surely. And inside of us, there is a groan. It's expressed in many different ways. Folks don't always realize. Matter of fact, they seldom realize what's happening inside of them. When they want a better party, when they want more excitement, when they want a thrill, when they want to come, somehow come to, to grips with some reason of why they're here and what's after this life, it's their soul screaming, saying, all around me I'm watching this house dissolve. I'm watching it fade away day by day. I'm watching the hair turn gray and the teeth fall out. I'm watching the knees give away. I'm watching the, the run turn into a little trot and then the trot to a slow walk. I'm watching it all fade around me. You don't realize how much it's moving, but your soul is recognizing it and it's crying out for something that will last, something that's eternal. And being that spiritual soul that God made and breathed into us, his breath and life, it longs for a house and a place in his presence. And so that soul of yours that we sometimes confuse its desires and we feed it with things from this flesh, an alcohol drink or a, a little party with our friends or more birthday cake or just many times we're simply masking the cry of our soul to have an eternal home, a place to live. And Paul writes about it here and he says that that's inside of us and, and we're groaning for it. If so, being clothed, verse 3 says, we shall not be found naked. We'll, we'll not be found meaningless and lost and wandering, but, but a purpose and a covering. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, verse 4 says, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life that the frailness of this life will be swallowed up by something that is impossible to destroy or kill. Inside you this morning, there is a desire that wants to be clothed with something more than just this flesh. And often, our shame and our sins and our past, and sometimes it's not necessarily a sin that we did or a choice we made, but something that happened to us. Sometimes that piles into our hearts and our heads and it tells us that because that happened and because of who we are and because of what folks have said or what they've drug us through, that somehow we'll never get that house, that we're not worthy of that spot, that, that we can never find that peace on earth, that the righteousness, peace, and joy that your New Testament says is the kingdom of God can't be obtained because... 
of my baggage. But as we've sorted through it the last two Sundays, the Lord reminds us that He didn't come just to save us and to sal kind of put a little salve on our wounds and set us down, but He came to transform our lives. Grace did not come to your house just to bring the unmerited favor of God, tell you how much of a sinner you are, how much of God you need, and try to reconcile that gap. But grace came to do much more than that. And you read about it in the book of Titus. In Titus chapter 1. Actually, let's move to Titus chapter 2. We went through that one real quick. Doesn't take me long once I get on a roll. But in chapter 2, begin reading at verse 11, talking about the grace of God. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. What's teaching us? It's that grace of God that we read about in the previous verse. The grace of God, it's appeared to all men, and it's appeared to teach us. That same grace, that unmerited favor of God that makes us realize we're sinners and we need a Savior. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. Everybody say redeem. Redeem, redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous, zealous of good works. There's a whole lot of preaching material in here, but jump, jump through it with me for just a moment. Normally as a pastor, I like that verse 12, that, that grace that tells you you're a sinner also teaches you that you need to live godly, right. holy, righteously. That's the foundation of the lifestyle living that we teach because... You cannot effectively have the power of grace in your life if you don't allow grace to teach you. If you grow up in your house and you never let, never let mama teach you, all you've had is just a, this little caregiver that's kind of waddled around the house and, and kept you in the line, but they, you leave it with the same empty head that you came into the world with. But because mama teaches, and mama never stops teaching, my mama's 83, and she still calls me every once in a while, tells me the things I need to do, stuff I got to watch out for. Grace, you don't get its full effect just because you know you're a sinner and need a Savior. You've got to let it teach. So as a pastor, I, I want to tell you that. But this morning, I don't want to focus too much on that. But grace is still teaching us, okay? So move on down. And it says, grace teaches us not just to live godly, but to look. What do we look for? The blessed hope. The blessed hope, folks, is really not heaven. The blessed hope is the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Heaven is just the place He's prepared for us. Our eyes on Jesus is not just a good song, not just a nice term, but it's grace that teaches us that all in life needs to be focused on where we're headed. Look, at, look to Jesus. Why? Because He gave Himself for us that he could redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. It's God's desire to have a peculiar, a set aside, a different group of folks who are committed to serving him, who love good works. Who love good works. The next time somebody tells you you're too legalistic, just flip that open and say, grace has taught me that God goes through all of this and teaches me that he wants me to love good works. Yeah. He wants me to be passionate about good works. The end result of grace is somebody who's passionate about doing good things. Amen. But in between all of that, in between the knowledge, that the grace of God, that I'm a, I'm a sinner need a Savior, and God wants to purify and blah, 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 all the way down to, He wants me to be passionate about good works, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in our heads and our minds. And there's a whole lot of distractions from this world. And I want to remind you this morning that God understands every little thing that has happened in your life. He knows the circumstances of your birth. 
He knew that before you were ever born. He knows all of the troubles and trials. He knows what you brought on yourself through your willful choices. He also knows what others may have done to you. He understands bullying. He knows all that. And it's hard for a pastor just to preach a message without preaching five or six others. But can I tell you something? Bullying is in human nature. And bullying doesn't go away when you get into eighth grade or tenth grade. Bullying doesn't go away when you become a 45-year-old adult. We just learn to cover it and mask it better. You've got to teach your children from the time they're small that everybody's not going to agree with you. Everybody's not going to like you. Some people are going to say bad things about you. You don't do that. But some people are going to do that throughout your whole life. You can't let them define. You've got to teach people that. It's in human nature to be selfish. And so everybody in this room, as we talked about in the very first lesson, has gotten beat up, slapped around. And some of you may have gotten it last week. Some of you may have found out from a customer you were trying to wait on what a slob and idiot you are that can't even do what they're simply asking you to do. I won't ask for a show of hands. I feel sorry for waitresses that get blamed for what the cook did. But you know what we let that do? We let that live inside of us and rattle around into our hearts and our heads to the point that we buy into what everybody's saying about us sometimes. And I want to remind you here today, grace says that God wants to come in and purify you unto himself for his own. In other words, when you get salvation, when you repent of your sins, when you start letting this word work in your life, when you get baptized in the name of Jesus for your sins, when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, God is doing a work in you that's taking every circumstance of your life that's taking all of the, the little details that occurred around your birth and your upbringing, all the way down through where you sit this morning, all the stuff that's happened even vo either voluntarily or involuntarily. He's taken all of that, and if you will allow him this morning by owning and claiming your baggage and bringing it and putting it right down here where it belongs at his altar, he will begin to take every one of those little pieces and weave together from the brokenness and the shame of your past, a glorious testimony of his power and grace and goodness. And he will set you up here and say, look right here, this is a peculiar person. That means they're unique and set apart because they've gone through some things in life and their path is uniquely different than others. Folks walk the same road. They were born into the same family. They may have experienced some of the same things, but nobody is like you. Nobody has done everything just like you've done. Nobody's been hit with the things you've hit, carried the burdens you've carried. You are not just part of a peculiar people, but you are a peculiar person. I have some things at home that probably don't mean much to anybody but me. I have a little stick. And uh, my wife, I, I don't know if I've explained to her what that little stick is. And so she may have tried to toss it out a few times because I've discovered it in other places and I've had to bring it back. I'm not blaming her because, you know, I'm not bullying you this morning. <laughs> I'm just saying to other people, it probably has no meaning. But a couple of years ago, Jonathan and I made a trip and it was just the two of us. And we were in Virginia and um, Civil War battlefields have always kind of interested me so there was one just right off the interstate so we pulled in and I had I knew about the battle and I knew about the young men but I didn't know the details of this but um, there was a situation where the south didn't have enough enough soldiers nearby to really defend this this community and they they thought they would just have them in reserve as just a show of force but they actually inducted into the army students, young men, at a nearby military academy. And they brought these young men, teenagers, 14, 15, 16, they brought them there and they thought they were just going to, to serve as just a show of force. 
But these young men actually became involved in the battle. And as they ran across this, this wheat field, these boys' shoes got stuck in the mud. And they literally ran out of their shoes. And they said after the battle was over, that field, field was filled with shoes. And they called it the field of empty shoes. And so walking through that field, I just reached down and pulled up a little stick just to remind me that children matter. Young people matter. And so I, I have that little stick. It doesn't mean anything to anybody, but it's peculiar to me. And I keep it. Sometimes you may think you're just a stick laying in the mud, but God has reached down and picked you up. You don't sing a pretty little song like some of the singers this morning. You don't play well on the instruments. You may not have a face that's really striking. Perhaps you're just one like the Bible describes Jesus as being one that just kind of was lowly and would be a man that you'd take the second glance at. He's just part of the crowd. You may picture yourself, but I'm telling you, to God, if you've been born again, you are a peculiar treasure that he has set apart. And he takes joy and pleasure from your life. Not just when you come together with all of us, but by yourself. So when you get up and walk down the street and you're doing your own business, just minding your own business, the Lord takes pleasure from your life. When you go to work and you look and live and act as God is directed in his word, he's taking pleasure from your life. If you get caught in circumstances and situations that are unpleasant and you take the brunt of some anger that should not really have been directed at you, the verses of the Lord reminds us about turning the other cheek and all those things. And, and God takes pleasure, though nobody else sees it. You and I are not working in competition to see who can earn the most merit badges here or who will know what I've been through. You and I are simply living serving and loving God so that he knows that we're walking in his way and we are happy to be a peculiar treasure. I have at home another Bible like this one. It's bigger than this one. And I, 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 I seldom use it. I decided that I would, I would kind of keep that one as just a little peculiar thing for me. So I keep it in a box by my chair. I... I actually used it, the only time I think I've ever preached with it was at Sister Shirley's funeral. I, I used that Bible, but Brandon and Jane bought it for me. And it's like this, but it's a little bigger. This is, is cowhide. It's real soft. And, um, but in that Bible, they stick a little note. And it, it tells you, I guess people have been confused, and sometimes they've sent Bibles back thinking they're dam damaged. But it says, the leather on this Bible is unique. There will be some scars in the Bible, in the, on the cover, but that's not a sign of damage. That's a sign that maybe the, the cow or the bull walked into the barbed wire at one point. It may have been where they stumbled or fell, or maybe the horns of another bull ripped the side. But, but the cover is unique. There's no two of these Bibles that are going to look alike. Because each one of them bears the mark of that particular animal from which its hide came. Well, I've compared you to slugs and everything this morning, but I'm, you know, you and I get punctured with a lot of things in life. There's some barbed wire fences that we tried to get out of sometimes um, just because of our stubbornness. And there's some scars here and there, but to each of us, we're unique. And God doesn't look at the scars of our lives as something that, that ruins us. But actually, the more character your leather has, the more valuable it is. Because it's more peculiar. It's more different. And I'm telling you all this this morning to tell you that that baggage that you think disqualifies you from so much actually sets you in a place to be of even more significance to God. You see, he doesn't love one of us more than he does the other. But sometimes those who come with a testimony of God's greatness have an ability to reach in and express things to folks that those who've never been down that road can't really relate to. There also is the power of God to transform lives so that when somebody 
that the world has watched. They've watched them run into barbed wire fences trying to live their own lives. They've watched them do goofy things and run headlong down, down the street against traffic. And they've watched, and I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically here, you understand. They, but they've just watched us do things that are just opposed to everything that God is and all that he teaches. But somewhere in that rush to, to find your own way and to make your own life and to, to chase your own dreams, somewhere along the way, there was this conflict that brought you into to contact with God. And he changed and transformed your life. And you allowed him through the power of his word and the Holy Ghost to change you into a peculiar person. All those people who've watched everything that you've done all your life and they've seen all the mistakes and they've watched all of the damage that life has done to you. They now have to stand back and they have to admire what God has done because you become a peculiar instrument of the grace and power of God. I'm telling you folks that if we will reconcile in our head that Jesus Christ did not come just to pick us up out of sin's muddy waters, wash us off and plop us down. He came to transform and change us. Grace did not come just to tell us we're a sinner and we need to take advantage of the blood of the cross. But grace came to teach us who we are, to teach us what God's expectations of us are. And when you understand what grace is saying, grace is saying, I want to take all of the mistakes of your past, I want to heap together all of the trouble, the problems, the issues of life you've been through, and I want to weave it all together and make a unique and beautiful testimony of my grace and goodness for this whole world to see. And in the doing, I'm going to give you peace that passes understanding. In the doing of that, I'm going to give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. In the doing of that, I'm going to give the Holy Ghost to you, which is the earnest of your inheritance, which is just a taste of what heaven's going to be like. I'm telling you today, when you claim your baggage and you bring it to God and you realize it does not identify who I am, God begins to work in us, change us. And that hopelessness that we feel and all the reasons and excuses begin to fade away because we understand it's not me, but it's Christ that lives in me that works. You can imagine Joseph's brothers. You remember Joseph? He was his father's favorite son. He had all those brothers. I think he had 10 older than him, didn't he? But God, God had something special for Joseph. And he also had something special for his brothers. But his brothers didn't understand that part of that was going to come through Joseph's life. Brothers didn't like Joseph. Joseph had dreams and told them all about these dreams, how they were going to bow to him and all this. And so they determined they were going to kill him. So out in the field one day, all these brothers by themselves, they determined they were going to get rid of him. But Joseph's brother, one of the brothers said, no, let's not kill him. Instead, let's throw him in a pit here. And the Bible says that that brother intended later on to come back and let him out. Threw him in the pit. They killed, a, they killed a lamb and they smeared Joseph's special coat with this blood. And they took that bloody coat back to his dad and say, look, a wild animal must have ripped him in pieces. He's, he must be dead. They lied to their father. But while that brother who was going to rescue Joseph later, while he was away, his other brothers found this caravan of gypsies coming through and they sold Joseph to them as a slave. So now the brother that they told their father was dead is actually a, a slave on his way into Egypt and for the next several years they lose contact. They didn't have cell phones and telegraph and all that. Um, who has telegraph anymore anyway? Um, I'm, I'm getting old. They didn't have any means of communication like we do. He, he got lost. And so years later, when this famine hits Egypt, and Joseph has written, has risen rather, to the top of the kingdom, and he is now governing and guiding all that has to do with bringing and collecting food and now passing it out to those who are suffering, these brothers come looking for food, and they come to Joseph. And Joseph 
recognizes them. They don't recognize him, but he gives them food, finds out that his father's still alive, and he sends them home. They come back the second time. I'm going through the story real fast. When they come back the second time, Joseph reveals who he is to them. Now imagine at that point, you're his brothers, and now that little boy that you got mad at because he said you were going to bow to him, you now realized everything he told you has come true. And not only is he your brother, but you don't have any means to eat and to provide for your family except he has mercy on you. And so you're thinking, we took his favorite coat that dad gave him away from him, we threw him in that pit, we sold him, and now we're asking him to take care of us. Be one of those mean brothers. What are you thinking? This doesn't good, is it? Make sure my will and everything's in order because I'm not going to survive this one. But Joseph instead has the whole family come into Egypt. He takes care of them. And then they live together in, in this community called Goshen, a great little community or an area of Egypt to raise, to, to raise sheep. It was a, it was a good, good place for them. Joseph's dad passes away. And he had made them promise, you bury me not here in Egypt, but back home. And so Joseph goes into the king and he says, look, my dad's died. He made us promise that we're going to bury him back home. So I need to go away for a while. So Joseph gets his brothers together. And the Bible says they take all of their family except the little ones and they leave them at home. And then they go on this procession. And when they get home, they have a seven-day mourning period where they mourn the loss of their dad for seven days. They finally bury their dad and they start heading back to Egypt. Years have gone by. Joseph has proven to his brothers he's forgiving, he's kind. But what, what does his brothers have in their bag? They still have guilt. They still probably have some shame. They still have a little worry and fear. Because on the way home, they talk to each other. And they say, look, dad's dead. There's nothing now to keep Joseph from getting rid of us. He probably did all of this all along, not because he loved us, not because he cared about us, but he just wanted to respect dad. But now dad's gone. So what are we going to do? And they came up with this idea. What we'll do is we'll tell him that dad told us to tell him. <laughs> you know, it all goes back to dad. You know, dad said, dad did. We'll go back and we'll tell him that dad said that he was to swear that he would not harm us. And since dad said it, we, chances are maybe Joseph will listen to us. So these guys who have lived all these years, that you would think they had lived long enough to process all of this, but instead, grown men still carrying around baggage from previous mistakes. But when they get to Joseph and they tell him, Joseph, Dad made us swear to tell you that you would swear not to kill us because of what you've done. And Joseph responds to them in Genesis chapter 50, and he said, look, what you thought evil against me, God meant it unto good. God meant it unto good. That unto changes everything. Everything that has happened bad in your life, God wants to make that unto good. He wants it to lead to good. But the choice is yours and mine. We can either be like these boys and carry around regret, carry around fear and anger, carry around unforgiven hearts. We can, we can carry around some shame, some guilt. We can do all of that. Or we can be like Joseph and say, look, guys, my life's not been pleasant. My brothers separated me from my dad that I loved dearly when I was just a boy. Not only did they separate me from my dad, they took my clothes and they made a mockery of my life and they threw me in a pit and left me by myself. 
And then later on, I heard them, some wanting to kill me. And, and, and they had me trapped inside of this thing and decided that they would sell me. My own brothers sold me as a slave. And for years, I was separated from my family. I was thrown in prison. I was unjustly accused by the lady that I was doing my best to serve her house. And every time I would rise to a position of some importance where I thought I was really going to finally make something of my life, somebody lied on me, something happened, and I found myself again back in prison. And even in prison, when I tried to help people, guys that talked about their future, they were worried about what was going to happen to them, and and I was used by God to help them interpret their dreams and and I even reminded them when this happens to you and you're given position back where you can speak to the king remind him that I'm down here in prison intercede for me but did they no they just took what I said As soon as they got free and got out they forgot all about me and left me down there nobody recognized my gifts it didn't give me any position of prestige It just left me in a jail. And the only reason anybody ever really came and validated my ministry was because they had nobody else to turn to. The king had tried everybody, all the wise men. Only then, it's, oh yeah, I remember. There's a guy in prison that when I had a dream and I couldn't understand it, he gave me the interpretation and it came true. Joseph didn't have anybody pulling for him. But somehow Joseph was able to process all of this and in his relationship with God was able to come back to his brothers and say, yeah, but everything I've been to, it was leading me to good. It was a bad situation, but it was leading unto good. And I'm telling you this morning that all of the stuff that's happened in your life, you can hold on to it because it's familiar. You can cling to it because... You've just got your your life bent in that direction and it's just too difficult to separate yourself. Or you can just step back and say, look, all this stuff that's happened to me, God meant it to lead me to good. Not to make me think that I'm a slave. Not to make me have a prisoner's mindset. Not to make me think my own family doesn't love me and I'm a reject and I can't fit anywhere. But God did all of this so that he could do something good in my life. I'm telling you this morning, we've stepped through these last two Sundays talking about the baggage that's yours. You can continue to carry it on or you can let it do for you what it did for Joseph and realize God meant it unto good. As I finish this morning, I want to jump back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in that chapter we read those first few verses but I want to slide down a little bit verse 11 says knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences knowing that there is a God who's gonna judge us all that that fear of that makes us want to persuade all of you Paul says as a preacher, but he says, we're we're manifest unto God. God God sees our heart. God knows the thoughts and intents and the actions and the purposes and the reason. God sees us, folks. And then he says, I hope that you all see us too, but, but God knows my heart. I'm not here just because I fear God. And then he moves on down to the portion that we referred to a while ago. He talks about how that God died for us and wanted to transform our lives and and he summarizes it then in verse 17 he says therefore because of what Jesus has done for us if any man be in Christ he's a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, 
as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, when God redeemed you, he redeemed you not just in one fell swoop as just a big person. He redeemed every circumstance of your life. When God purchased you, when he redeemed you, and that's what redeem means, is to exchange something of value for you. When he redeemed you, he redeemed the abuse you may have taken as a child and said, that's mine. When he redeemed you, he took all those broken relationships where people may have rejected you and walked off or dumped on you or rejected your life. And, and he, he took that and said, that's not his, that's, that's mine. He took all of the broken hearts of our lives. He took the, the misconstrued ideas that we tossed to people and they, they didn't understand what we were trying to say or do. And it, and it brought confusion into our worlds and lives. He took away all the dreams that didn't come true. He took the times that your brothers threw you in the pit. He took the times they lied to your father. He took the times where nobody wanted to hear your ministry. And those who took advantage of your ministry soon forgot about you. He took all of those piece by piece, one by one, and he said, that one's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. Because it says, he who knew no sin became our sin that we might become his righteousness. And there's no... There's no there's no sin in righteousness. You can't hold on to what you used to be and claim ownership of it and still claim God's righteousness. So when he said, I'm reconciling you, it's like him going down through your checkbook and one by one reconciling every expense you wrote, every check, every, every cash withdrawal, one by one he checks them all off until it's all done and all complete and everything is reconciled and your sin has become his and his righteousness has become yours. Owning and claiming your baggage. You see, it's really not a bad deal at all, folks. Because God has let everything in your life happen to this point. Because he wants to lead it on to good. As you stand with me today. I haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about the Holy Ghost. But the deal breaker in all of this, folks, is the Holy Ghost. There's something about that power of the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. That all of the good intentions and all of the desires, all of the hopes and dreams that you have by themselves are not going to muster the ability to reconcile in your mind and in your heart everything that I've tried to toss out here to you today and the previous two Sundays. But there's something about it when that Holy Ghost comes. When that Holy Ghost comes. I, I, I'm trying to find words and I, I, I really cannot fully express what God desires to happen in your life. But it's through the power of the Holy Ghost that kind of tips that scale. And if it's been a while since you've let that Holy Ghost work in your heart, I encourage you this morning for the next few minutes to allow the presence of the Lord to move in your heart. They're sending me texts from upstairs. Your children are praying right now with Brother Barter, so they're asking us not to bother them for the next few minutes. So there's no point in getting in a big hurry. They've got another 10 or 15 minutes there. We can take that same time right here and let the Spirit of the Lord move in our hearts. And let the power of the Holy Ghost be renewed in us. And anything in your life and heart that you're still clinging to, I'm telling you this morning, those individual little, little episodes that have occurred in your world, one by one, God has reconciled them. And he's here this morning telling you, just give that back to me because I've redeemed it. It's not yours to hold on to. It's not yours to cling to. Those fears and doubts and failures aren't yours anymore. I redeemed them. I reconciled them on the cross. And this morning, I encourage you to dump them out here where all these suitcases are. If you haven't repented, this is a great time to tell God that you're sorry for your sin and your past 
and ask him to take away what he's redeemed and to give you the cleanness and freshness of his spirit. But if you have repented, seek with all of your heart that power of the Holy Ghost and tell God, Lord, I want my soul and my spirit filled with your presence. And then believe that the same one who's forgiven you of your sins desires to fill you here this morning. And you can leave this place transformed, trading your baggage for his cleanness, trading your old robes for the robe of his righteousness because his presence and his word are united here this morning for us. As they sing a song, I invite you, whatever you're feeling this morning, to bring your baggage to the Lord. If you've already dumped it out and you reconciled it all with Him, come and find a renewing of that Holy Ghost in your heart and life. Because tomorrow there'll be more barbed wire fences to bump into and there'll be more opportunities to make choices and decisions. And you need that power of God to guide you, to lead you, and to remind you who you are. There'll be some folks tomorrow who won't appreciate all that you are and may not say good things about you. But if you have that Holy Ghost living in your heart, you can remind yourself, I am redeemed. And like Sister Hannah has told us, I am a child of God because this Bible says I am. Respond to the Lord this morning. Join us around the front as we sing. And let's let the, the Lord work in our hearts as we exchange that baggage for his presence and goodness. In Jesus' name.